Hey there listeners, this is Rod Gerardo, research resident at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And whether you're watching us on YouTube, listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, the best way to listen is on the Stay Current Pediatric Surgery app. It's in the Apple App Store, it's in the Google Play Store. But until then, enjoy the episode. July is in full swing. You know what that means. Your pediatric hospital is probably flooded with new fellows, new interns, heck, new medical students. So for this week, why don't we just talk about one of the most highly pimped pediatric surgical topics out there, Hirschsprung disease. To do that, we're gonna to talk to Dr. Nelson Rosen. He's one of the associate directors of the colorectal center at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And he's joined by one of the colorectal nurses, Patty Kern. So. Guys, go ahead and take it away. Hirschsprung's disease is a congenital issue. It is a condition that children are born with. It usually affects the lowermost aspect of the intestine. AKA the rectum or the sigmoid. Now to understand Hirschsprung's, you have to understand how the intestine works. You have to realize that the GI system is like a big tube, right? It's like a big tube that goes from your mouth to your anus, but it's not just a pipe, it's also a pump. But the way that pump works, there's two systems of nerves. One system that allows it to squeeze and one system that allows it to relax. Those are the ganglion cells in the submucosal and the myenteric plexus. And in Hirschsprung's disease, we are missing the system of nerves that allows that to relax. The lowest part, the rectum and the lowest part of the colon are missing the, those nerves. That area is always affected, and the question with Hirschsprung's is how much of it is affected. So with Hirschsprung's, we know that it always ends right above the anus, but where does it begin? That's where the variability is. Well, here's what Dr. Rosen says. About 85% of the time, it begins in the very end part of the sigmoid colon or the beginning of the rectum. And in about 10% of cases, it's the entire colon. And then a few cases, it's somewhere variably uh, higher up in the colon. Okay, so Hirschsprung disease is a congenital aganglionosis of the distal aspect of the intestine. And that's important because those nerves are needed for normal peristaltic movement. That's important to keep in mind because that kind of tells you how these patients present. More details on that, here's Patty. Um, most, I think 90 to 95% occur in that new, or are recognized in that newborn period. Uh, the first sign is they usually do not have any stool within the first 24 to 48 hours. And that first bowel movement, we all call it, say it with me, meconium. So failure to pass meconium. That can lead to some clinical symptoms. Um, after that, they will accumulate with bloating, uh, not passing stool, um, and could be vomiting. And usually that's a clear sign that we need to investigate. So what happens when, I don't know, the baby hasn't had that meconium and maybe is starting to show some clinical signs? Then we get into the workup. In that situation, in the newborn period, uh, some studies will be done. A contrast enema exam could be done in radiology. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a water-soluble contrast enema. What is the radiologist looking for? Is the lowest segment of the intestine, the rectum, is that narrower and then it dilates up above that? That's a sign that we have concern for Hirschsprung's disease. And if they're really concerned? Uh, if there's real concern, then a biopsy will be done where we take a tiny piece of the back wall of the rectum and examine that for nerves. There, he's talking about a suction rectal biopsy. The device is basically made to cause negative pressure, and then at the very tip of the device, it, there's a little area where it can take a little snag of tissue, and then we can send that to the pathologist and see if there are any ganglion cells in there. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. So that was for the newborn patient. What about for an older patient who maybe is having some signs that are leading us towards the diagnosis of Hirschsprung disease? Then what? In older children, Hirschsprungs can be missed. Uh, those situations usually establish themselves. Children with Hirschsprungs very rarely thrive uh, and develop normally. Because they're often 
small for their age group. You know, you just gotta track that growth curve. And then they have significant constipation. Maybe the pediatrician has tried some different therapies. And then they're thinking, well, we need to refer to either a gastroenterologist or a surgeon and get down to the bottom of this. In that case, the diagnostic pathway is still kind of similar. You might get some plain films to see how constipated they really are. And then you might move on to a contrast rectal enema and then you might end up needing a biopsy depending on what that finds. Sometimes in older children that have, don't have a story that's really suggestive, like they were fine for the first couple years and then all of a sudden the constipation got really bad. These are low risk situations for Hirschsprung's disease. Uh, sometimes a biopsy ends up being done, but it should usually be done after routine management measures are tried. So what he's saying is, if you try to treat the constipation and then they get better, you probably don't need a biopsy, right? But let's say you try some different things, laxative, enemas, you know, you're trying Senna, you're trying all these different bowel regimens and you're still having a kid who has trouble with constipation, then it might be reasonable to say, you know what, yeah, let's go ahead, let's move forward with further imaging or a biopsy. At some centers where they have experienced gastroenterologists that conduct anorectal manometry, manometry can be performed. So remember from physics, manometry means that you're measuring pressures. You're measuring maybe a pressure differential. How does that work? Well, here's Dr. Rosen explaining it. The uh, gastroenterologist uses a balloon catheter and measures pressures in the uh, anus and in the rectum. And there's one specific thing that they look for related to Hirschsprung's disease. Now, when the gastroenterologist does this test, there's actually a specific part of the test that they're looking for. What is it? There is a reflux called the rectoanal inhibitory reflex. That when you blow a balloon up in the rectum and stretch the rectum, the sphincter should relax. That is a normal rectoanal inhibitory reflex. But if the patient has Hirschsprung disease, that reflex, it's gone. It's not very sensitive. In other words, if you have a normal manometry, it doesn't completely rule out Hirschsprung's disease. Huh? Now, I, I can tell you that there are people out there that would debate that with me. Uh, I remember in my training, the surgeons at the uh, University of Montreal, the pediatric surgeons, actually did the manometry, not the gastroenterologist. <gasps> Pardonnez-moi. And they debated that with me because they said that in our, situ in, our, in our experience, every time we have that finding, there's Hirschsprung's disease but nobody I know would operate on a manometry alone. So if there's a suggestive manometry, a biopsy will still be done. Okay, so the gold standard for diagnosing Hirschsprung disease is the biopsy. You can't rule it in or out unless you have a definitive biopsy. And it turns out it's actually easier to get than you would think. Here's Patty. A biopsy, a suction biopsy, can be done at the bedside for children who are in the newborn phase. And even up to a year old, uh, they're pretty reliable. But after a year of age, we like to take the child to the OR and actually do it under anesthesia so we can go up higher. So I think it's important to understand that you and I, without Hirschsprung's disease, have no ganglion cells or these cells and these nerves that Dr. Rosen talked about in the first, the very first part of our rectum. So when patients get to about a year old, that's when you want to start thinking, maybe we need to go to the OR and get a surgical biopsy instead of a suction rectal biopsy. And the suction biopsy tool is what we routinely use in babies. Uh, basically, it's a, a little tube that goes, we place it inside the anus at the bedside, and by placing suction, it applies a little bit of suction at the tip of the tool, pulling a little bit of the lining of the rectum into it, and then we fire a little, little knife part of the tool and it cuts off a tiny, tiny little piece. And that works in babies because that it, you don't need much in a baby to get to the level where you would look for the nerves. But in older children, older children are bigger and their tissue is thicker. 
So you can't get enough tissue with a suction biopsy tool uh, really after a year of age. So that's why you need to take them to the operating room and a chunk needs to be taken. So we take a tiny little piece out, we stitch up the area that we took it out of. It's a very simple procedure, it takes about 20 minutes uh, and they go home the same day. So there you have it, the basics of how to diagnose Hirschsprung disease in both the newborn and then the older pediatric patient. What did you guys think of this podcast? Did you hate it? Did you love it? Either way, leave us a comment below. No matter where you are, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or the Stay Current Pediatric Surgery app. And if you don't have it yet, download it today. It's in the Apple App Store. It's in the Google Play Store. So until next time, I'm Rod from Cincinnati Children's. And remember, knowledge should be free. <laughs>